Now, do turn, please, to Malachi, chapter 1. And this evening, I want us to have a little look at verses 6 to 14. Now, as we mentioned last week, the book of Malachi addresses God's people when they're finding life hard and when they become disenchanted with God. As a result of that, the people have become backslidden. They become hard and resistant to God's words. And they've left their first love. So last week, with the first five verses, what we saw is that the first and fundamental thing that the Lord addresses with his people in such a situation is the whole issue of love. They doubted the love of God for them. And of course, it's our knowledge of the love of God for us that stirs up our love for him. And that Christian love, it's the fuel of our worship, it's the motivation to change our lifestyle. And it's the thing that sorts out our priorities. What I want us to do this evening is to have a little look at uh, verses 6 to 14. That's the beginning of the second block of the book of Malachi. The block runs from 116 to 29, if you just want to make a little note. But we'll have a look at the first section of that, verses 6 to 14 of chapter 1 tonight. What happens in this section once the lord has addressed that fundamental issue of love is he addresses the first practical example of their backsliding and their lack of love which is their worship the point really in this section at least the point for us tonight is this our view of god is seen in the way we worship okay i think that's obvious But um, it's perhaps not quite as obvious. Um, It's not quite as obvious to us as it should be sometimes. And I think some of that comes out in this passage. So, how do we treat God? Now, the answer to that should be obvious, shouldn't it? If God is God, then we should treat God as God deserves. That's obvious, because after all, God is so much greater than us. And what that means in Scripture is that if God is God, we should, he should have the worship of our hearts and he should have the worship of our lives. So in Hebrews 13, for instance, Therefore, by him, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The sacrifice of our lips, notice that, the sacrifice of praise to God, the worship of our hearts. And also, as we read in Romans 12, we should present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. The worship, the sacrifice of our lives. Now, in the book of Malachi, there was a lot of worship going on. The people were bringing many, many sacrifices to the temple, and the priests were offering them. But the Lord challenges the people, particularly the priests in this section, Uh, that in spite of all their sacrifices, rather than honouring God, they are, in fact, despising him. Now, that's quite striking, isn't it? But you get this in this section here, in verse 6, for instance. A son honours his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where's my honour? And if I am the master, where's my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to the priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? That's the challenge, you see. Despite their worship and despite their sacrifice, they're not actually honouring God. Underneath it all, they actually despise him. And the nature of their sacrifices, the nature of their worship, shows it. So the challenge for us, as personal as it is, from a passage like this has to be is the lord pleased with our worship i was speaking with someone just recently um, in a difficult situation in a a a church in a major denomination they've gone into the church they've started to uh, pastor the church and they find that the people in the church are just not interested they've got a group of freemasons that talk all through the sermon 
They've got a group of people doing practical work in the church and a minister went down to the church to see what was going on. And they said to him, why are you here? This is nothing to do with you. It's our responsibility to do practical work. Um, no interest in the word of God, no interest in the ministry, no interest in the worship. In that kind of situation, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? That although they're strong churchgoers, there's something seriously wrong as regards the worship of God to behave in such a way. But it can sometimes be more subtle than that. So we have to ask the question, is the Lord pleased with our worship? In this little section, what you find is that the Lord challenges them for not worshipping him as he deserves. They are offering these defiled sacrifices. And the reason they do that is because they don't honour God as he deserves. Their attitude towards God colours their attitude towards worship. And that opens the door to them offering all sorts of defiled and inappropriate sacrifices. Okay, verse 6. What's wrong with their worship? Number one, they failed to recognise who God is. That's strange, but it happens. Accusation one, you despise my name, says the Lord. The name of God, the character of God, who he is, who he reveals himself to be, you, you despise that, you're not interested in that, you treat that with contempt, you play that down. And he challenges them. He says, look, sons honour their fathers and servants respect, fear their masters. Well, I'm the father, pardon me, I'm the father <clears throat> and I'm the master, but you don't honour and you don't reverence me. You despise my name. How is this? Why is this? This would have been a challenge to the priests because the priests were men of a certain age. They would all have been sons. And many of them, if not most of them, would have been fathers. And so when the challenge comes, a son honours his father, immediately it strikes home, doesn't it? How have I treated my father? How do I expect my children to treat me? Well, hold on, says the Lord. I'm the father. Do you honour me in the way that you should? The issue here, see, is they despised the name of God. And that idea, despising his name, treating him with contempt, what it really means is when they thought of God, they thought that it was no big deal. They show more respect to an earthly father or to an earthly master or to an earthly governor than they showed to the true and living God. And that's the heart issue. That's the challenge. So how should we view God? Well, God is the father. And the fatherhood of God means that Christian people are in a relationship of love and commitment with the true and living God. And if that's true, that he's the father who's committed himself to love us and to care for us, how should we respond to that? Because surely to honour the father means to glorify him, to recognise who he is and to praise him for it. How great a father is God. You know the verse in 1 John 3? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. And there's that note of amazement in that verse in 1 John 3. What manner of love? The, the language is kind of, this is love that's from another place. You don't get love like that around here. That's the emphasis of the word. That God would make us his children and that he would become our father. That's an amazing thing. Well, he says, if I'm the father, do you honor me as such? And he's the master in the relationship of authority over us. And surely if we see God as the one who has authority over us, we should serve him as those who belong to him. But remember, as Christians, we belong to him twice over, don't we? Not just because he's the creator who's made us, but because he's the redeemer who's brought us back with the blood of his own son. So the Lord challenges them. You've despised my name. You don't treat me as you should treat a father and a master. Not the great father, the great master. But the priests are unable to see what all the fuss is about. And so they come back to him at the end of verse 6. Yet you say, in what way have we despised 
your knee. When thinking about this, this is what's going on here. The Lord says, you despise my name. You don't treat me as you should treat me because you don't think about me as you should think about me. In your minds, I'm no big thing. No big thing. And when they hear that, they do not understand what God is making a fuss about. Because as far as they are concerned, they are honouring God just as much as God deserves. And that's the heart of the issue. In our worship and in our service, we all honour God as much as God deserves, as much as we think God deserves. And the nature of their worship and the nature of their sacrifices exposes that their understanding of God is so faulty and falls so far short of what it should be. Worship, for them, it's about giving God what he deserves. But he doesn't really deserve that much. Faulty, broken animals, maimed, blind, lame. It's not about giving God the best. It's not about giving God the first things. It's certainly not about giving God the heart. And you remember in Psalm 51 and verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So that's the first accusation and challenge. You have, so you despise my name. The second one is in verses 7 and 8. The accusation is, you offer defiled food on my altar. Their attitude to God is seen in their attitude to worship. They bring faulty sacrifices to the temple because they think that's all God deserves. Notice the way it's set out there in verse eight, verse seven, excuse me. You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? Well, by saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You, why do you bring these faulty, broken sacrifices? It's because you don't think worship matters. The table of the Lord is contemptible. Worship's not a big thing. It's not important. And if it's not important, it doesn't matter what sacrifices we give. And the reason worship is important is because God isn't important. And the Lord is exposing all of these connections. See, if God isn't important, then worship isn't important. And if worship isn't important, it doesn't matter how we go about it. But the Lord had told the people the kind of sacrifices that he would accept. Uh, Leviticus 22 and verse 20 says, Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And there are specific examples given in Leviticus 22 of the kind of defects as well. But in general, any animal which is not perfect, it has a spot, a blemish, a disability, blindness, lameness, whatever it might be, it's not appropriate to be offered to the true and living God. And the Lord had told them that, and they knew that, but the people offered and the priests accepted any old animal, blind, lame, sick, what's going on? Well, God is not a master who needs to be obeyed, so why listen to that? Give him anything. And God's not a father that needs to be honoured, so who cares? The Lord says to them, you wouldn't offer such a thing as this to your governors. Go and try it if you want. Bear in mind at this time, Israel was a province of Persia, one of about 120, the historians tell us. And the governor that was appointed by the Persians had a right to receive animals from the people to eat and to feed his household and his staff. Would you really take that blind, sick animal and offer it to the governor? You know, you sometimes see these products with a little badge on them, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen, and you think, well, that must be good if the Queen uses it. 
Well, that's the idea. Would you really give that to your governor? You wouldn't dare give it to your governor. So why do you give it to me? The only conclusion you can possibly draw is because in the eyes of the people, the governors were more important than God. If you look at verse 14, what's very striking is the Lord says, cursed will be the deceiver who has a flock and in his flock a male and makes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what's blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. A great king, the one that rules over all the rulers of the earth, the one whose glory outstrips them all. Well, if you wouldn't dare give it to your governor, how could you dare to think about giving it to me? There's a danger always, isn't there, that we're more concerned about what people think of us than we are about what God thinks of us. That we behave better in the presence of certain people, our boss, whoever it might be, than we do in the presence of God. We're always in the presence of God. And sometimes the way we would behave when we're on our own the way we would behave even in the context of public worship, it's not really worthy of the great king. And the Lord's exposing this. So that's the second thing. They failed to treat God as he deserved. The third thing is in verses 13 and 14. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it. They found worship boring. What a weariness. And they sneer at it. Rather than the worship of God being something joyful and invigorating, for them, worship was just a matter of going through the motions. They'd rather be somewhere else if they only could. There was a weariness and a burden, but I suppose we have to do it. And in verse 14, this was true even when they made a vow to God. Now, a vow, there could be a sacrifice associated with a vow. If you remember Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, she prays to the Lord for a child, a son. And she makes a vow to God that if the Lord hears her prayer and gives her a son, she will give that son to the Lord for the whole of his life. She, she makes that vow. She's not obligated to make that vow. But she makes that vow freely to the Lord that if he answers her prayer, she will gladly give. Vows are free. And yet in verse 14, when they make a vow and promise to give God a male from the flock unblemished, which is what they're supposed to do, what they do is they give, a, uh, they give another animal, an animal which is blemished or even stolen in its place. They don't even have enough respect for God to give to God what they've promised freely. I think if you stand back and look at it, it, it's working like this. In their minds, God was someone that they were to benefit from as much as possible and serve as little as possible. God was someone that they were happy to take advantage of whenever they could. When he blessed them, they thought that was great but they invested as little as possible in thanking him. They took it for granted, and they got away with what they could. The reason? Their hearts are elsewhere. They despise the name of the Lord, and it follows through in the way they worship. So those three things, those three accusations, are what we have in this section of Malachi. They despise the Lord's name. They defile his altar with their sacrifices and they find the worship of God boring. I wonder why. Let's try a few things. The people brought defiled, diseased sacrifices to the priests, and the priests accepted them, so they're both at fault. Now, it could run in their minds like this. I need to take an animal as a burnt offering. A burnt offering is burnt up completely. Nobody benefits from it. Nobody gets to eat it. What a waste. Why should I sacrifice something valuable by burnt offering when I could give this animal in its place? After all, it's all being burnt up anyway. They might be thinking like that. 
It could be things like, you know, we just come back from exile in Persia. The Persians aren't as fussy about offerings as our God. The Persian gods will take any old animal. Why have we got to be different? And why have we got to stand out? And particularly, why have we got to do that when it costs us? Surely God's just being unreasonable. This worship of God is too hard. Maybe they were thinking, we've got loads of disease than maimed animals. If we give all of those, it'll be better for everybody. Surely lots of sacrifices are better than one or two pure ones. Maybe volumes more, imbe- more important than quality, you know? Maybe the people were even bribing the priests, and the priests were accepting the bribes so that they could pass off the dodgy animals and keep the best ones for themselves. But whatever the reason was, the bottom line was the same. They thought that that was all that God deserved, the leftovers, and they kept the best for themselves. So we need to apply this now to our situation as believers and to the situation that can be faced in churches of the Lord Jesus Christ in our days. What about our worship and what about our sacrifices? Number one, the only atoning sacrifice, the only sacrifice which takes away sins, which is acceptable to God, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's fundamental in Scripture. And there are people who offer blemished sacrifices instead of Christ, and there are priests who accept them. What I mean by that is, there are people who say, uh, I, I believe that God will accept me because of my good works. And there are Christian teachers, so-called, who say, quite right, try your best, and you'll get to heaven. And it's just a lie. It's a blemished sacrifice that God hasn't asked for, and he takes no delight in. It doesn't make anybody acceptable to God, and it's a shame on Christian leaders when they tell people that. Sometimes it's more spiritual. It's our praise. It's our church attendance. That's the way to be accepted by God. But it's a lie. And if the priests accept that, if church leaders accept that, all they're doing is misleading the people. It's a pattern of religion where self is on the throne. And we think that that's all the Lord deserves. It's not so difficult to be accepted by God and it's not so hard to go to heaven. I just need to try a little bit harder and hope for the best. And what a tragedy when church leaders, so-called, tell the people that that's enough. The true position, of course, is that the Lord has no delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. But he's prepared a body for the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in Hebrews 10. He's come to do the Lord's will. He delights to do the Lord's will because he's come into the world to be the true sacrifice for sin. Now, what I mean by that is, first and foremost and fundamentally, when we're talking about our worship of God, our coming before God, our being accepted by God, Anything we put our reliance in other than Jesus Christ himself is folly. And what a desperate state we're in when we've got church leaders who tell people that that's okay. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. His name is the only name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. The life that he gives is a ransom for many. It's Christ and it's Christ alone. But there's a second thing. As Christians, our sacrifices of thanksgiving need to be the very best that we have to offer. Now, I mentioned earlier on that the Christians offer sacrifices of thanksgiving not to be accepted by God, but because we're accepted by God. And in Hebrews 13, for instance, as I read earlier, the sacrifice of praise to God The following verse, do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. In Romans 12, the sacrifice of our own bodies, living sacrifices to God. All of these things are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ if we're Christians. But you see, 
the quality of our sacrifices, the quality of our praise and thanksgiving, the quality of our service, the quality of the way we give ourselves to serve the Lord, those things just reflect how great we think God really is. The Israelites here gave defiled sacrifices because they thought that God deserved nothing better. And in our situation, in our lives, sadly, we always have to be on our guard and ask ourselves a question. Are we really giving to the Lord in our lives that which the Lord deserves? Are we giving him the praise of our hearts and the service of our lives and our very selves? Because after all, surely that is what our great father and our great master and our redeemer deserves. The third thing, true worship isn't boring. Now, there can be times when Christians will say in churches that they find the service boring. But let me challenge this a little bit. It can be true sometimes, can't it, that we try to get away with putting as little effort in as possible in church meetings and in our personal Bible reading because our hearts are elsewhere and we're distracted. So we come to the meeting, we put nothing in, we get nothing out, and we say, well, that was boring. And what that shows is that our approach to worship is wrong. It's light, it's superficial, it's not from the heart. We think, oh, you know, if it doesn't matter to me, it doesn't matter to God. I, I'm not really in the mood this week. I'm not really listening. You know, we can, we can fall into that kind of trap. In recent years, there's been uh, talk in some circles about what's known as reverent worship. The importance of reverent worship, and we need to recover reverence in worship. Now, I think that's absolutely true. But the problem for me is that a lot of the talk about reverent worship is focused on how people dress and what Bible version they use. And that doesn't seem to me to be the heart of reverent worship at all. To me, the heart of reverent worship is this. Recognize who God is. Recognize what God wants. And wholeheartedly give him our best. That's the issue. That was the issue in the book of Malachi. And that's still the issue today. Our biggest problem in worship is that we've lost the sense of God. I had an interesting conversation with a friend in the week. Um, we were talking about a situation in a, a major Christian denomination and some of the, the rules that are being passed, some of the things that are not just being allowed to take place, but they're being enforced on congregations. And we were talking together one another and saying none of us thought we'd be in this situation 30 years ago. What on earth has happened? What on earth has happened? How do we respond to this? And of course, the key issue isn't our lobbying or any of that. I'm not saying the things like that don't have a place sometimes. No, no. But the key issue isn't our lobbying. The key issue is that we've lost the sense of God. How can people in the church of Jesus Christ pass rules which are directly contrary to the will of Christ revealed in his word? And how can good Christian evangelical people come together to worship God and allow their minds to wander all over the place, not be concerned about the things that we are singing, not be concerned about praying for one another, not be concerned to honour God in our lives day by day? If that's true, then all that does really is it reflects on the fact that we've lost the sense of God and the Lord says, your sacrifices are defiled because you don't think worship is important. The table is contemptible. You know why? It's because you really despise my name. Our God deserves better for Jesus Christ's sake. So who's God? He's our Father. And he's our Master. He's the one that the angels worship and serve. But who's God? He's our Redeemer. And so Christian people have got a reason to worship and serve God that the angels will never have. Which is that the Son of God became man. And he laid down his life for us. 
so that he might wash us with his blood. And when Saul of Tarsus saw that, his response was, what shall I do? And when John the Apostle saw that in Revelation chapter 1, he fell on his face as though he was dead. And when the Apostle Paul talks about it, he said, those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's who God is, isn't it? And that colours our sense of worship. What does God want? He wants us to recognise his greatness. Psalm 29. Given to the Lord, you mighty ones. Given to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. That's what he wants. He wants a heart that's been changed by mercy. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you won't despise. He wants pure devotion. Psalm 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who hasn't lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. What does he want? He wants the dedication of our whole lives. That's the issue. So what about our sacrifices? Let me just touch on some things with you. How well do we prepare for the worship of God? Do we ever turn up late or half asleep? Are we ever distracted partway through the service because our minds are on other things? Are we sometimes just desperately waiting for the service to be over? You know, it's kind of fair enough in some ways to say, well, at least I'm here. But the question is, is that really what the great king deserves? How about our singing, you know? Now, the content of our singing is important, isn't it? It's got to be biblical and faithful and honouring to God and true. But the nature of our singing is important as well, isn't it? With our hearts and with our minds and with our voices. Isn't that what the great king deserves? Our pray. How we pray. Do we pray? Are we rushed? Are we formal? Do we take time to be alone with God, to confess our sins, to thank him, to thank him for his goodness, to thank him for his wisdom? Do we pray according to the will of God? Do we pray with reliance on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we cast our burdens on the Lord with confidence that the Lord will sustain us? Are we careful to recognise his answers to prayer and to praise him for them? How about the word of God? Is it a lamp to our feet and a light to our path? Is it sweeter than honey to our mouth? Do we search the scriptures when we have a problem with humility and ask the Lord to help us? Do we come to the meetings with expectancy to hear the word of God, looking to see what the Lord will say to us and praying for hearts that are ready to obey? What about the Lord's Supper? Do we come to the Lord's Supper with repentance, with a thankfulness and an expectancy? Do we come to the Lord's Supper and look up to the Lord Jesus Christ and thank him for his remarkable mercy in laying his life down for us? You see, there are always challenges, aren't there? Because as long as we are here in the Christian life, we are imperfect and we struggle and the devil will come and he will distract us and the world will tell us, you are mad to take these things seriously. It's really not that important. But you know what it is? And the reason it's important is because God matters. And if God matters, worshipping God matters. And if worshipping God matters, then all of this, our hearts, our lips, our hands, it's all significant in the eyes of the God to whom we belong. Let me just touch on a couple of other things. The dangers of defiled worship. Now, there's a few things um, in this passage that are important. The first and the big one is that if our worship is wrong, we dishonour God. That's the point that's emphasised again and again. To offer defiled worship means that we despise his name. And you know, that in and of itself is far more important than anything else. Whatever effect false worship might have on us, whatever effect defiled worship might have on the people who observe us, the key thing is, what does God think? 
because the Lord's prayer starts, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And if we don't start with a desire to hallow God's name, then obviously things are immediately wrong. The second thing is in verse 9, which is, if our worship is wrong, the Lord won't accept us. He says in verse 9, Now then, entreat God's favour that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favourably? If I behold iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's the principle. So there's no point in coming to the temple and praying when the sacrifices they are offering are not the sacrifices that God wants and that's all they think God deserves because they don't honour him and they don't love him and they don't commit themselves into his hands. That's one of the big lessons in prayer and one of the big lessons in worship, isn't it? That we have to come to God and cast ourselves on his mercy. Come to God and commit ourselves to him. Come to God and give him our all. Come to God and hold nothing back and hide nothing away. That the Lord desires truth in the inward part and clean hands and a pure heart. And we come to the Lord like that. There are other things. Um, the church will become a disgrace. And the Lord's judgment itself will be provoked if our worship is just shallow and empty. But maybe more of that on another occasion. The last thing to mention here, and just to mention quickly, is in verses 10 and 11, which is God's purpose for worship and the future of worship. See, rather than let the people continue like that, the Lord's view is that it would be much better that the worship stopped. So in verse 10 he says, Who is there, even among you, who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I've got no pleasure in you. The priests should have closed the doors to the temple rather than accept such sacrifices. That's his point. And there are churches, I fear, that have lost the gospel and are now going through the motions but they are not worshipping God through Jesus Christ. And in many ways it would be better for the doors to close. But you know what? We also have a responsibility in our situation to ensure that the worship that we offer to God is acceptable. Because if we start to compromise there, then we fail in our purpose of honouring God and we are in danger of the Lord casting us off. But in verse 11 he says, this isn't the end. For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Notice that twice he says, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Because that's the heart of it all. This isn't working in Jerusalem. But the Lord's purpose is that all around the world, amongst the Gentiles, in all the nations, there would be true worship. His name would be great. They would know who he is, the great king, the father, the master, the redeemer. They would love him. They would trust in Christ. They would be saved. They become the people of God. And then, wherever they are all around the world, they would offer pure sacrifices. That's what happened when the Lord Jesus Christ has come into the world. That rather than this worship in Jerusalem, the church has spread throughout the whole world. And there are men and women in congregations like this all around the world today who are worshipping God in spirit and truth. Because you remember the words of our Lord to the woman in John chapter 4. The hour is coming and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. It's not the end. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, by his spirit, our God has done something so much greater. The physical temple failed. The Old Testament priests failed. But the Lord Jesus Christ raised up a spiritual temple 
the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that church shall grow until finally all his people are gathered together before the throne to sing a new song from a pure heart. I think there's a lot in a passage like this to challenge us. It's not always comfortable, but the word of God is always necessary. What does the way we worship say about the way we view God? That's the issue for us this evening. Let's pray. Father, we do ask in your mercy that you look down upon us. We praise you that we can come to you and know that you are a God who understands us better than we know ourselves. We ask, Father, that in this church we might be known as people who have a great view of God, people who delight in you, people who want to worship you, people who recognise your goodness as something which is truly beyond our ability to fully grasp. Lord, would you do that for us? Would you reveal to us something of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ? Would you give us an assurance of our sins which would warm our hearts to overflowing? Lord, we pray in your mercy. Don't let us ever become people who just go through the motions or who think that somehow you are not worth it. Lord, we praise you. You are the true and living God. You are the one who's keeping your people safe in the world and will finally take them home. Help us to praise you, Lord, in this situation today where you've placed us. Might all the honour be yours in the Saviour's name. Amen.